In the past in Okinawa, it was considered that sisters were the spiritual guardians of their brothers and men in the family. And even now, women are thought to have special powers. These little strips of cloth you see here are known as tisaji in the Okinawan dialect. They look like either a scarf or a small towel. In fact, they probably weren't used for anything. They were given as keepsakes to men when they were going off on a trip, on a boat, to ensure that they came back safely. And because the mother or the sister of the man in each family made, the, made these personally, no two of them look alike. It's a rather interesting kimono up on the wall here. This one is known as a watajin. This would have been used in the northern part of the main Okinawan island. And it's reversible, which is rather unusual. The inner part with the pink design here is bingata. And the outside part um, is woven in basically a kasuri type style. But if you look at these wh this white stitching here, these horizontal stitches, uh, which give it a slightly three-dimensional feel. This is known as hanaori and requires a high degree of expertise. It's difficult to say with any certain certainty, but this kimono was probably made for a celebration of old age, uh, for, probably for a woman, although these kind of kimonos would also on occasion be made for men as well. In the old days in Okinawa, when these kimono were being made, superior weaving skills were actually quite common. Next, we're going to take a look at some history to find out how these skills developed. At one time, Okinawa was an independent nation called the Ryukyu Kingdom. The Shou family dominated the ruling class. The kingdom flourished as a trading nation, partly because it was in a convenient location for ocean voyages. However, its good location was a mixed blessing. To the west was the vast realm of China. To the north was Japan. The Ryukyu Kingdom thus lay within the sphere of influence of two major powers. It had to work hard to maintain an independent identity. To secure its autonomy and to advance trade, the Ryukyu Kingdom focused on China the greatest power in Asia. It sent tribute every time a new Chinese emperor came to the throne, invited ambassadors from China, and built up friendly relations. But then in the 17th century, Ryukyu was attacked by the Satsuma clan, invading from the southern tip of Japan. The Ryukyu kingdom yielded to this military might and came under Satsuma control. The court culture was not destroyed, but the Ryukyu kingdom now had to pay taxes to Satsuma. Textiles came to play a key role in maintaining relations with China and the Satsuma clan. For one thing, Bingata was valuable as tribute paid to the Chinese emperor. It was also worn by dancers who entertained ambassadors from China and Satsuma. It was a beautiful symbol of cultural sophistication. And visiting VIPs could see that the islanders were dignified and civilized. Bingata was thus an indispensable tool of diplomacy. and textiles also became a key commodity. The Ryukyu Kingdom had little in the way of resources or agricultural produce, so large quantities of textiles were used to make tax payments to the Satsuma clan. The ordinary islanders provided the mass labor this activity required. And because the Ryukyu Kingdom had to ensure the Satsuma clan was satisfied, a high standard of quality was essential. This is a form of administrative guidance that was issued by the Ryukyu court. It shows officially approved textile samples with specified colors and designs. For problem-free tax payment, 
it seems that quality control was a must. In Satsuma, the textiles received from the islands were sold on to customers in the rest of Japan. So another key factor in the beauty of Ryukyu textiles was the strictly practical need to maintain good relations with China and Satsuma. In 1868, the Meiji era began. Ryukyu was formally incorporated into Japan and eventually became Okinawa Prefecture. That marked the end of the Ryukyu Kingdom. Having lost their status as a strategic commodity, Ryukyu textiles went into decline. The continued prosperity of the Ryukyu Kingdom was greatly due to the superior weaving and dyeing techniques that they had. In fact, textiles were the major industry of the region. The fact that they had to pay their taxes in the form of textiles was of course a burden on the population. But the strict guidelines they were given for how to make the textiles in fact contributed to the refinement of their techniques. People had to abide very strictly by the illustrations that we saw earlier. The Ryukyu officials specified, of course, the type of material. They also stipulated in very great detail the motifs. So each one of these motifs would have to be made with specific widths and lengths, hard enough to draw them, let alone to weave them. And you can imagine the level of skill involved. We've seen how the Ryukyu kingdom became part of Japan and was renamed Okinawa. Now, moving into the 20th century, during the Second World War, major battles were fought and great damage was inflicted on Okinawa, and all weaving and dyeing completely stopped for a while. However, after the war, the traditions were revived, and next we're going to take a look at some of the people who were responsible for that. <laughs> 